Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on the distinguished gentleman from Colorado, Mark Headley. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Mark, things are things are happening so fast in the world of Scientology watching. And today, what I want to discuss a, a few things. Let's start off with the $100 million Scientology paperweight on Sunset Boulevard, known as Scientology Media Productions. What's your take on media productions, Scientology TV? Well, you know, we had a facility that I worked at in Gilman Hot Springs, California, Riverside County, and it was basically a bigger, better, more set up version of the Scientology media productions that we had huge sound stages. We had recordings, uh, recording booths, uh, recording studios, music studios, mixing studios. I mean, all of the latest and greatest stuff. And I'd say they spent more than a hundred million dollars setting up that facility easily. And, and they, and, and that property was directed and kind of the, the, the purchase of it was overseen by Hubbard in the, I want to say late seventies, early eighties. And it's a 500 acre property. It's giant. Um, it's got staff housing for a thousand plus people. I think it was 1600 people. They built, uh, apartments for there at the property. And, uh, it's where L. Ron Hubbard's mansion is. It's where David Miscavige lives, the chairman of the board religious technology center. Um, and so when they built another one of those in Los Angeles, the one at gold was practically a ghost town. I mean, when I worked there in the early 90s, it was almost up to a thousand people. Last escaping person told me that there's a few hundred people left there, like two, three hundred people that are left there at the property still working there. So you've got editing bays sitting idle. You've got studios empty. You've got. And so the fact that they built an entirely new studio in Los Angeles really, to me, just seemed like they needed to get rid of some money. And David Miscavige needed to like do something or show that he was doing something. And um, I, I'd say most of the stuff that they're producing there is stuff that you or I could produce on a laptop. They're shooting most of that stuff on location. So they don't even really need any studios. And everything else is just done on computers. So why all the, why buy a, an old TV station? It, it just... It never made a lot of sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me. And um, and obviously, they're not getting more people into Scientology. Um, the, the amount of information that's being put out by people that are exposing Scientology far outweighs the amount of information that's being put out by Scientology themselves. So, and, and you can see by their, like just a, a cursory glance at their Twitter followers, the Scientology I don't know. What's the Twitter hand? Do they have a Twitter? They have a Twitter handle for that place, yes, right? They have Scientology Network, which is the Scientology TV. And there you it has uh, 27,000 followers. Now, here's my here's my, my thesis on this. Scientology TV on Twitter has 27,000 followers. I think that's the real number of Scientologists total in the world. And this is a four-year-old number. And the reason I think it's the best number is because if you're a, a media company, Scientology TV, and you get caught with 100,000 fake Twitter followers, your credibility gets shot to hell. That's why I think this is a, a good that number. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that, and that would make sense because a lot of people are pegging their numbers between like 10 and 20,000 members. And then if you add up all the Sea Org members or staff members that are around the world in the various organizations, if Scientology, because I've seen Scientology put out, like they have these policies or these issues that come from Scientology management, and it says that they need to get people to follow them on Twitter, get people to like the channel or like the app or do reviews of the apps and so on. So if they've got up to 27,000, you're right. That's probably, that's probably like a one for one count or maybe even a few people who've got a few accounts that can hit it twice or three times or whatever. But uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's funny. You say 27,000 followers. I'd, I'd go out on a limb and say that you and Karen's channel probably has videos 
individual videos that have more likes or or, or views than that total amount of 27,000. <laughs> oh, oh we, we, we do. In fact, on my uh, Surviving Scientology radio, my my top rated uh, video is Jefferson Hawkins with 144,000 listens. Wow, that's and, a, so. There you go. So that's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Your 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 one channel is outperforming that entire hundred million dollar facility. Oh, we are in fact. Well, no, it, your it, one it, your one channel is outproducing all of Scientology, not not just that one. For, for production facility yeah, and management, the base, golden era, the everything. So, you know, that's why I'm saying there, I don't get it that, that, that like you'd think, you'd think they would do something to generate more views or more followers. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Well, I'll give you some, I'll give you some hard numbers for the audience. Uh, Karen's surviving Scientology YouTube channel has, we're just coming up on 7.8 million views. And that's, wow. And that's, and Mark, you've been here. You've done videos with us. Claire's been here. Yeah. Uh, and you see, we have, a, we have a simple, you know, $350 camera. We have a green screen. We yeah, and you have like camera. a little green screen, like a little piece of fabric on, a, yeah, on some mean, stands or something. You know? yeah, it's just a <laughs> humble mom and pop setup. Make videos in your own home. When we started it, we never knew it would get as big as fast. But it shows the interest. It, and, and again, even look at Leah Remini winning an Emmy, going into her, yeah. third, her third season of Scientology in the aftermath. It shows that people want to know the truth about the subject, not the lies. And that's what you get on Scientology TV. A couple things about Scientology TV I notice. It's repetitive. The old YouTube channel they had before Scientology TV, like Meet a Scientologist, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing that same thing. And these are dull. And then, of course, they're, they're, uh, this is really funny to me, Mark. They do uh, like an hour show on Bridge Publications. And it's like a printing factory. Yeah, and, and, it and doesn't. That, I mean, that's no. Nope. Well, that's that when you're in the bubble. When you're in the bubble of Scientology, it's like, hey, we can print books. <laughs> it's like, okay, like <laughs> it's like no one outside of that bubble is impressed by people printing books. In fact, people have been printing books for hundreds of years. It's not like a, it's not a new thing. It's not like a revolutionary <laughs> thing that you're able to print books. And even more so, it's almost like. Why? Why are you printing books? You know, you can, um, you can just that same file that you're sending the printer. You can just send that to a Kindle, and uh, you're good to go. Or you can uh, see it on your Kindle app on your your iPhone or your your computer. I mean, it. it why are you killing trees to print stuff? You know, that's kind of the way it was the whole time I was there too. We were always about a decade or two sort of behind. The, the 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 real world as i call it we were about 10 to 20 years behind the real world in terms of the technology when i was there when i was le when i left there in 2005 they were still making and producing cassette tapes in 2005 <laughs> still making cassette tapes oh this is funny i mean i had a cd player when i was like 11 <laughs> and in 19 uh, probably 1990, we were producing 50,000 cassettes a week there at Golden Era, and they were still cranking them out in 2005. So, I mean, I don't even, I think I might have, I have a cassette deck for dubbing to a CD player. I have one of those at my shop that if somebody has media that they bring to us for an interactive for stuff, that we can convert it from a cassette to a CD. But I don't know many people that even have cassettes that, that, that you could actually like whip out and say, oh, yeah, let's put that in and play it. Well, I'll give you a data point that's hilarious. Back in 2006, uh, uh, I bought a Toyota Avalon, right? It's a, it's a, big, okay. it's a big car, right? You know, this, it's a big, comfortable car. It's either the, uh, the uh, poor man's Lexus or the rich man's Toyota. I don't care. But it, I was in sales. It was a nice roomy car, plenty of luggage. I could put four adults in there, right? Now, 
when yeah. I bought when I bought the car, the salesman said, you know, this this is a car uh, mostly old people buy. You know, I'm not old, but you know, I'm not young either. So I said, well, I like it because I, I do a lot of driving between LA and uh, Silicon Valley. So it's a good freeway car, right? And I can put luggage for a week and sales samples and stuff. He said, now one thing, sure. this, one thing this has, because it's mainly marketed to older people, it this is the last year of production where the, any Toyota product will have a cassette tape player. And we only put yeah. it in there because old people buy the car. And so I had, <laughs> until I got rid of that car. That was in 2006. Yeah, until I had, got rid of the car, I had a... Uh, a cassette tape player. Now, I played one cassette in it just for the novelty of it, and yeah. it sounded like crap. I mean, you forget well, yeah, I mean, how it's bad not cassettes. The best, yeah, it wasn't the best uh, <laughs> medium to uh, jump to in terms of uh, sound quality, but uh, but yeah, so so it doesn't so it doesn't surprise me that in the the year two th when did they buy that studio 2016 so, 2015 2014 i think uh they bought okay. it yeah, they opened it like a year or two yeah. ago yeah and you yeah know, so it doesn't surprise me that in after let's say just 2015 there they or 2014 that they bought an analog tv station <laughs> this isn't that's not a, a stretch for scientology to do that move and then for some reason dump a bunch of money into it so that they can produce things that all you really need is a computer no and on the bridge publications printing factory documentary two, two funny things they brag about having like you know 20 tons of polycarbonate pellets to make cds yeah so this is injection molding cds in 2018 it's like to use a scientology command hey come up to present time David Miscavige, you don't yeah. need polycarbonate pellets to make CDs. Even when yeah. there, in, when I was there at the base, you could put every single film, every single lecture, and everything that L. Wright should, L. Ron Hubbard had ever written. You could put it onto an iPod. Everything. Yeah, hold one it in your iPod. Hand. Hold it in your fit, hand. It would fit everything. Yeah, and. And that would make that would make all these things they're talking about totally obsolete. You don't need a printing press. You don't need a CD pellets. You don't need any of that stuff. You just put it on an iPod, and then everybody who gets into Scientology just sell them an iPod, and all they do is they just buy the courses or buy the things that you know, and just go in the app store and buy the additional stuff you need, and then nobody has to be making all these physical things, and there doesn't have to be changing a of money and hands and you just you just they just do it all in the store that would be so efficient but it also wouldn't cost them that much money and they can't stockpile money they got to spend money and i'm sure that that's what all these things are these the ideal orgs scientology media productions they got to spend all this money because it's hard to go and hit one of these billionaires up for 20 million dollars to donate to Scientology when they ain't spending any money but as long as they're spending 100 million dollars on a facility and they're spending 10 million dollars on an ideal org here and 10 million dollars I guess it makes it a little easier for them to hit those guys up and uh, pump them pump some more cash out of them sure and it also it, there's an IRS requirement that 501c3 um, tax exempt religious organizations cannot engage in uh, excessive capital accumulation so as a function wow. of, of of spending they, they money gotta, they gotta, yeah. yeah they gotta make some but you know it's silly though because it's really they're just they're getting around that just by buying up stuff and they're you know they're keep increasing their net worth by buying real estate and um i don't know if the media productions is that great of a purchase because they're buying equipment. They're buying. They're investing in technology, which in two years will be completely outdated. So that's not really a that's not really a smart purchase. But I mean, it, it does get rid of some capital. So sure, it does. Uh, to and me, that to me, that's. I think that's their best benefit is just to show that they're doing something, and then they can tell a bunch of people they're expanding and they're the fastest growing religion, even though they're the fastest shrinking cult. And um, and they and I really do think that they are losing members. They're losing. There's a we st after Leah's show started getting really popular. 
tons and tons of people started reaching out and saying, how can we help? What can we do? So this foundation was created, the Aftermath Foundation, to sort of uh, assist people who are trying to leave Scientology, get, get on their feet, get a job, you know, do, do whatever they need to do to kind of reintegrate into the real world. Because usually your family or friends in Scientology will cut you off uh, when you decide to leave or if you speak out against it. And um, this has been driving Scientology crazy that this exists because there's so many people that are leaving Scientology. There needs to actually be an organization that helps these people. So um, I know they're losing people because otherwise there'd be no reason for the foundation um, to help these people that are trying to get out of there. And um, I think it really shows the state of uh, Scientology today. And uh, and it's just a snowball effect at this time, at this point. The more people that can be told about what's going on in there and the more people that can find out the truth, the more people will leave, the faster they'll leave, and the quicker we can you know, move on and uh, be done with this whole Scientology nonsense. Absolutely. And the Aftermath Foundation is to the complete discredit of the Church of Scientology International who dumps people after years or decades of labor with $500 on the street. Or yeah, they literally, throw, they literally throw people out like trash. And the people that don't work there, it's even worse because they don't even get the $500. They just get told... They just literally get kicked out on this on the street by their family or their parents or their brother or their sister or whatever, um, and they get told, you know, until you recant and you know recognize the wrong that you've done against Scientology, you can't be part of our family anymore. And some of these people, they don't have any way to get to work without mom's car that she's lent them for the last few years, or they don't have a room to sleep in anymore, or you know, it goes on and on that the, the the horrible things that are happening to these people that are basically that are being abused by Scientology and refuse to continue to be abused. Um, they're being punished for, for standing up for what's right. So, um, so that's really what the, the aftermath foundation is there to assist these people as we can, um, as we have resources to do so. Yeah. Now, now going back, go, going back, uh, we were talking before the show, you, you wrote your book, Blown for Good, uh, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, what, 10 years ago? It was in 2009 when it came out. So, yeah, almost a decade ago. And, now, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, well, th th what's interesting, when we talk about how Scientology, uh, uh, the Church of Scientology is collapsing organically through, through former high-ranking CERG members like you speaking out through publics leaving, through staff members leaving, through celebrities leaving, you you began what became your book, Blown for Good, started as posts at Xenu.net and other places. And That's uh, right. I, I, was, I was posting a lot of these stories that are in the book. Um, I was posting them on internet boards starting in I want to say starting in 2006, maybe late 2005, 2006, um, I was telling about musical chairs, that this yeah. sadistic theme of musical chairs that David Miscavige played with all the executives of Scientology. I was talking about how there was physical abuse. Um, all of these things that are in excruciating detail in the book of like what led up to it, like what thing happened that then David Miscavige thought, ah, I want to play a game of musical chairs. Like that whole kind of evolution of these things is detailed in the book. But at the time, uh, Scientology was, they had created these binders. And, um, and anybody who was reading stuff on the internet that was still in Scientology, they'd round them up and they would be shown these binders to prove. And they were told these things are all not true. You know, David Miscavige has never even yelled at somebody, much less laid a finger on them and no one's being beat up and no one's being thrown in swimming pools and he didn't play musical chairs and and for years and years and years they denied that any of these things ever took place and and they you know they they just said this guy's lying he's just he's crazy he doesn't know what he's talking about and then later on the tampa bay times they did this um it was an investigative series that it was called the truth rundown and they, they basically 
told a lot of these stories. They interviewed other people that had left the base after I had. And not only did these things happen, but even after I left, even crazier things were happening at the base. And that's where you get the, the what was the SP room or the SP hole when I was there turned into just the hole where these executives have been locked up for years and years. And, um, and of course, um, when put to task by the St. Pete Times or Tampa Bay Times, whatever it was, um, Scientology not only admitted that, yes, David Miscavige had played this sadistic game of musical chairs. Yes, he was throwing people in overboard or throwing them in pools or the lakes there. Yes, there was a culture of they had, They basically admitted to just about everything that I had written about. And for the most part, every single thing in the, in the book um, was not only admitted to, but Scientology in their defense in our lawsuit, my wife and I followed, uh, filed a lawsuit against Scientology. Scientology admitted the Blown for Good book into evidence as fact in their defense. Wow. So, so they came, they, they literally, they came full circle from de denying it, never happened, none of this stuff ever happened, to it's 100% fact. <laughs> that, that, that is, that's extraordinary how in, in court they, they have to admit your book is evidence. Um, yeah, they had a signed copy, no less. They had a signed copy, autographed by myself. <laughs> wow. You know, it's interesting. Just, to, just but, to, um, a historical footnote that's, yeah. that's sort of a copy of that. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote yeah. his, his affirmations. They're some kind, sometimes called his admissions. And uh, yeah. former Seerg member Jerry Armstrong took these when he when he blew, right? Yeah. And the uh, L. Ron Hubbard's affirmations are damning. They show the demented nature of his psyche. All men shall be my slaves. And they sued, and they sued him because they took them, but then they said that he never wrote them. <laughs> well, but, then, but then Mary Sue Hubbard sued to get them back, claiming they were his personal property. Yeah, but how could they be his personal property if he never wrote them? Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's like crazy. They did the same, didn't they do the same thing with OT3? Said, yes. no, that's not OT, that's not Scientology. I don't know what that is, but uh, please don't let that be public. And, and we're going to have Scientologists check it out of, the, the court library so that no one else can get their hands on it. Yeah. Um, but it's not Scientology. I mean, it's, they do, they've done this many times. It's not, it's not unusual for them to, to shoot themselves. What do they call it? Foot bullet to, yep. to shoot themselves in the foot um, in spite of themselves. They, they, they always manage to do something um, that just totally backfires. And in the book, um, one of the things that I that I really uh, detail is there was a video that we produced in 2004, and the video it was actually the third version of the what's known now as the Tom Cruise video where he's in the black turtleneck. Oh yeah, and you uh, go to guns. Yeah, there was two videos of that, two versions of that video before that ended up being the version hmm. that was used, and the one that one that. Um, people ha people have seen on YouTube or whatever where he's in the black turtleneck and he's just 100% crazy talking Scientology. That video, David Miscavige spent a week straight in the editing bay massaging every single frame of that video into what you see on YouTube. So some people think, oh, that's just chopped up. There's no way that's the actual video. Um, it's been edited or, you know, it's been messed with. That sign Scientology wouldn't put it out like that. No, no. The video you're seeing is the final product that David Miscavige spent an entire week massaging and making into the video it is. And when he was done with it, he, he made us all watch it a whole bunch of times at the base. And he said that this video would be the most, one of the most important videos in Scientology's history, which ironically is is 100 percent true because <laughs> that video that video is basically what turned the internet against them completely like it, it they, they might have done some other things in, in before that that kind of you know pissed off the internet sure. but when they try to take that video when somebody posted that video on youtube and they try to take it down the internet just said no no 
that not, this ain't happening. We're, this video is ours. You can't take it back. And, and, and that's when and anonymous. Have, yeah, that's <laughs> when anonymous. Exactly. Launched. Yeah. And uh, that's right. That that. So it really was one of the most. And and you know, even for people like me that was speaking out then, that video did kind of provide not not the video, but that whole situation of anonymous and the media and everything surrounding that video. It kind of provided some air cover for people like me that were speaking out because it's like, well, no, no. I mean, this guy's talking about all this crazy stuff that went on, but yeah, look at this video. Tom Cruise is crazy. He's acting crazy in this video. And now Scientology are doing all these heavy handed tactics to try and get the video off. And so it really kind of backed up what, what I was saying and, and, and the stories in the book and, and even the whole, even that there is that video and I talk about how we made it and, and um, yeah, I was, so the reason I'm, this is all fresh to me. And one of the reasons I want to do this interview is because I just finished doing the audio book for the blown for good book. And um, it's going to be released on um, Amazon, audible and iTunes in uh, hopefully in the next week or so. But, um, but I was reading a lot of these things for the first time um, since I wrote them. And even when I wrote them, I wasn't going back and rereading it. I was just, writing it down and then the book kind of got chopped up and made into what it is today. But going back and, and rereading these things and reflecting on, um, you know, some of these things that had happened so many years ago now, um, it was actually, it was kind of funny and it was, um, it was, it was there, it was therapeutic writing it, but it might even have been more therapeutic reading it again at almost 10 years later because I realized just how far I've come, you know, in the last, you know, I guess 28 years since I started working um, at the headquarters. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. And um, it, there's a whole bunch of crazy stories in there that I didn't even remember that uh, I didn't include it in the book and uh, just craziness. Just, it's, it's really 15 years of craziness. That's really what, that's really what it is. 15 years of Scientology craziness. And this is at the top of Scientology. So whatever craziness is happening in Clearwater or in Ohio or wherever these other Scientology organizations were, this is the craziness that's going on where David Miscavige is running the day-to-day -day activities of the international Scientology management organizations and just it, people are just running rampant and the people running Scientology are kids, literally kids that haven't gone to school, um, have no education and are in this kind of Lord of the Flies environment. They're the ones making international decisions about Scientology. And when you see behind the scenes of that, it, it truly is remarkable how somehow they've managed to get where they're at today. Oh, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. Uh, Mark, ju just a little bit of a going back in time, the period in which you wrote your book, Anonymous was active. One thing that stands out, yeah. out to me as longtime critic is you and, and Jason Begay, you hosted a, a party at Lake Piru in California. Yeah, uh, you know, up along Lake, the other side. Was that, uh, no, uh, Lake I'm Pyramid. Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, Lake Pyramid, yeah. It's extraordinary. Uh, Mark, ju just a little bit of a going back in time, the period in which you wrote your book, Anonymous was active. One thing that stands out, yeah. out to me as a longtime critic is yeah, you and Jason McGay hosted a party at, at Pyramid Lake. And I remember that I remember going to the party and the, the great thing you and Jason McGay did is you, you let Anonymous, Indies, Old Guard, everyone, you know, attend. And it was a big, yes. tent. it was a big tent. And to me, it, it was so amazing. That moment in time was where culture turned in a big way against the Church of Scientology and saw it for what it really is, the horror. Because when you, when, yeah. you, when you posted musical chairs on Xenu.net, I read it and I went, holy shit. I mean, it was shocking. It had visceral power. It was like being slugged in the stomach. Like, I can't believe this, but it's true. It went on. And so at that party, I remember I, I went to the party, uh, said hello to everyone. And then I see Larry Anderson, who was in the orientation film, and he had just blown the church. He had yeah, just left that's right. the day before. And I went, 
there's the guy in the orientation video who says, yeah, you know, you can choose Scientology or you can blow your brains out or jump off a bridge. Yeah. And I met Lady Bird, who, who was a prominent critic. She's no longer with us. But there were so many great people there. And a lot of it constellated around your book, Blown for Good, because it was the first in its class of high-level Scientology manager writing a book. So Blown for Good was a very captivating name because it meant you were blown for good. You were never coming back. And yeah, it, I wasn't going to get rounded up like uh, like they did to most people. <laughs> no, but it also defined, Blown for Good, the book defined an era. A, a lot of us, it, it just gave the flavor of the of the era is I am blown for good. I am not coming back. It made it, it for a lot of people who left Scientology, that just that term allowed them to allowed them to have an affirmation. I too. Am yeah, blown, I'm blown, I think, I think you're good. right. I, I never yeah. thought about it like that, but you're right. And even at that time, it wasn't a lot of like now you can buy. I think it I think Karen um, Karen Schles Presley did a uh, like a, she made a list of all these books that have come out. And I think there's 30 books on Scientology now that you can buy. Yeah. And when there my book on. came out, there was like, it was, when my book came out, there was one other book that had been written by somebody who was also in um, the Sea Org. I think uh, Nancy Naney came yeah. out with a book. It came out, I think it almost came out even the same week or the same month as mine did sure. in 2009. And those were the only two books that were from, you know, former Sea Org members. I think John Atack had a book out that was maybe even 10 years before that. And I don't think he was in the Sea Org. I think he was a, a Scientologist. I don't there, remember. He well, might have well, been on well, staff. He, he was a Scientologist. But look, there were the standards like uh, Peace of Blue Sky, Mad Men or Messiah. Messiah. Mad Men you know? or Messiah, yeah. And, and then... Scandal. Scandal of Scientology. Yeah, Paulette Cooper's book. So there were the older standards, but no, your 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 name and title defined. It was almost created a, a genre, a blown for good as as a genre or a, a, an affirmation, a statement. And Nancy Maney's book was extraordinary. It was very painful to read. So this you you opened the door to a lot of other Sea Org members writing books. And now that you have the audio book, I can hardly wait. Now. You have yet another book coming out next year. What's yes. the, what's the next well, book? What I well what I what I did was the the blown for good is the fifteen years that I was at the base. Basically, it's the the time I spent in Scientology working at the headquarters, and then the next book is going to be the next fifteen years of since leaving really, and I'm hoping to come out with that probably next year sometime. Um, and we'll do we'll try to do the audio book at the same time on that one. But, um, but yeah, so, and that's going to take, that's going to basically take people through all the crazy craziness that they did after us, after we left. So even though we weren't working for them, we weren't involved with them, <clears throat> excuse me. It, it talks about all these crazy things that they did, the, the, the fair game, the, the private investigators, the, the harassment, the lawsuit, the, all the things that took place um, that Scientology did to try to, to, to basically to try and silence us and, um, and, and what they did to our friends and our families and, and all this stuff. And in some cases, the stuff they did after we left was even worse than while we were there. I mean, d d much, just the, worse. The, the, the lengths that they, the lengths that they would go to, to try and ruin our lives, ruin our businesses, ruin our uh, relationships with people that were helping us, and you name it, it was it was it was pretty extraordinary, and um, and, and let me and ask yeah, you, it kind me... of and it kind of is finished. The, the thing that was kind of crazy is the way that the book kind of started was I was um, the book is called The Greatest Good. That's the name of the book. So my published company BFG. We only print good books, blown for good and the greatest <laughs> good. <laughs> but um, and that title actually came from Janet Reitman, who was an author who did an article for the Rolling Stone and then went on uh, a Scientology article in uh, Rolling Stone and then went on to write the book in 
inside Scientology. And I actually met Janet at at Nancy Maney's house at a at a Super Bowl party um, in um, I want to say two thousand seven or two thousand eight. Yeah, and um, and uh, we were talking, and I can't we I we came up we I, we were talking about Scientology and. We kept talking about the greatest good, the greatest good, the greatest good. And then she said, oh, that would be a wonderful um, title for the book. And I thought, oh, yeah, that would be a good title. And then she ended up using Inside Scientology. So I'm taking it. It's done. It's a great um, title. But, and, uh, and, and by the way, I'm one of Janet's biggest fans. I, I, yeah, I, no, I, I Inside love, Scientology work, was yeah. another book that, you know, there wasn't a lot of books. So she and she was kind of one of the first authors to, to take a stab at it and and really – she did that article, and I think when she did that article, she uncovered so many stories and so much information that it, it was only natural for her to end up doing a book um, and probably still had more stories that didn't even end up in there. But regardless, the book started The book started out like this person left, and I wanted to write about what when they left and what led up to sort of their coming out. And um, – and then another person left, and I thought, oh, that could be another chapter. And then another person left. And pretty soon, I couldn't finish the book because every time I talked to a new person that had escaped, um, I thought, okay, good. This will be the final chapter. And, and people have so many significant people, some people that no one has, has even heard about yet. Some of these people, no, the world, the public – doesn't even know that these people have yet left Scientology or how or why or what led, led to them escaping. And, um, and, and it's going to take at least another year or a year and a half for these people to tell their stories and for them to actually come out. And that's sort of what's kind of hanging the book up is that they have to, I've already written it, but they have to, they have to tell their story before, um, the book comes out because otherwise it's going to be like, what this, this person left. So, um, it's kind of, it is kind of crazy. And, um, it's also exciting that there's so many people leaving Scientology that I can't finish my book on people leaving Scientology. <laughs> oh, I, I understand. And, um, look forward to the book and look, I'm going to buy the audio book as soon as it's released. You're a natural born storyteller for sure. And uh, switching, switching in our, that's giving me a good segue in our interview about talking about storytellers. The biggest yeah. nonsense story of the past two weeks has was David Miscavige receiving a medal in, from the Oh from my the God, Columbian, I saw this. From the Columbia National Police. And the medal was for saving humanity from violence, evil, and drugs. It was a trans... It was, and they even said it was a, tr a transparency award. I was like, "What?" <laughs> and and this thing, okay, for for uh, people read it. Obviously, you know, it was on Tony's blog, and I I did a post done on the Scientology Money Project. But basically, for on the uh, on the on the underground bunker, Tony Tony Ortega did a whole yeah. article about it. Yes, Tony d covered it on the underground bunker. I covered it on my Scientology Money Project. It's been covered on Twitter, plenty of places. But for those of for those of you who weren't following the story or may have been out of town on vacation, David Miscavige received a medal from the Columbia National Police. However, the general well, they, they yeah yeah they 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 positioned it. It's very sneaky. I mean, yeah. on even on the when you when it's covered in the media and stuff like this, they have a picture of David Miscavige receiving this, this medal from this general. And the, is it a general? He's a police general? Yes, he's a police general. And, albeit, albeit he was and he's in full uniform. Yes. He was and behind him, it's behind him are all these military officers. And he's in full uniform. Yes. And behind him, it's behind him are all these military officers. So you think. But they're not. They're even fake military behind the general and David Miscavige because those are Sea Org members. And Sea Org members dress up like a fake Navy in uniforms. So when you see the picture, you think – anyone who sees the picture, I guarantee you, if they're not familiar with Scientology or the Sea Organization, they assume this is a legitimate thing. Where are you going to get a uh, 100 – 
fake people to dress up in Navy uniforms behind this, this military general. Well, you, if you have your own fake Navy, then you've got uh, hundreds of them at your disposal. And they frame the shot perfectly. If you didn't know they were Sea Org members, you'd assume they were police or military or whatever group that the dude giving metal was with because he's got, he's got all his people with him. Or even that it was at their base where David Miscavige was awarded the medal. Sure. And no, no, let, me con let me connect some dots here. The, uh, it's, uh, it's retired Colombian police general Carlos Romero Mina Bravo. Okay, he's been retired for six months. He, General, uh, General Mina, as he goes by, was retired six months ago. He did not have the authority to issue the medal. Moreover, they, the free winds, uh, uh, Scientology ship sailed to Barbados. It wasn't even done in Colombia. It wasn't done in Cartagena where the free winds docks. They took a retired general yeah. who had no authority to act on behalf of the Colombian police or the Colombian nation. He had no authority to display the Colombian flag or other insignia. And this created a storm of publicity, negative publicity down in Colombia. The, the, I bet. The police, the police themselves, Columbia report says, headline, Columbia's police chief, I'm sorry, Columbia's police embarrassed over decoration of Scientology chief. There's an investigation into why this caper was done, Mark. So wow, and you know, and you know, this is not this is not anything new for Scientology. They've been doing this for decades. They find people that uh, like a good ham sandwich. They like to be wined and dined. They like to get a little envelope filled with some cash, and uh, they like a first class ticket to wherever Scientology uh, would like to have them be to present one of these silly medals or awards or keys to the city or proclamation of the David Miscavige. You know angry elf day whatever they have and th like lee baca lee baca did this for scientology for probably 10 20 years he was in their christmas parades he shook hands with dave miscavige when they opened an organization in california and los angeles and 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 lee baca was d just like this general dude they probably dusted this dude off and flew him out and wined and dined him and um you know, he was happy to do it. What, what, what does he care? You know, and and Scientology then positions it as this. They got this award from these guys when that it's it was basically Scientology giving themselves an award from some dude who's retired. <laughs> exactly. Who had no had no authority. Now, uh, what's interesting is uh Colonel Prado of the uh, Colombian police has long been the face of Scientology in Colombia. And now we know, okay. now we know, this is where Scientology made a mistake. Colonel Prado uh, has been around a long time. He's spoken at Scientology events. He's been on the free winds. In fact, I know someone, Colonel Prado of the Colombia National Police has made fundraising calls from Scientology ship the free winds to American Scientologists. Wow, that's crazy. So my question to the Columbia National Police, why is one of your officers, a colonel no less, making fundraising calls on behalf of the Church of Scientology from its ship? Why isn't he acting? Is that what the Columbia National Police have appointed him to do work full time for Scientology? Now, my theory that I'm working on and investigating is the hidden who by Colonel Prado, his boss was General Mina Bravo. And I think mm -hmm. by Miscavige wanting this award for himself, because he's trying to build his legacy, has, ex yeah. has exposed some of the real people behind Colonel Prado. And there's a list of other officers mm -hmm. as well. This is what the Colombian media is investigating. Follow the money. So Miscavige, yeah. in his lust for stolen valor, you know what, Mark, that bothers me? If David Miscavige got an award for, like, contributing to literacy in Colombia, something modest, nobody, yeah. nobody would have really cared. But when you get a medal for saving no. humanity, oh, come on. That, yeah. that, that's where Miscavige yeah. went to full-blown messiah. I have a medal well, for it's saving also humanity. 
yeah, it's it's also it's just David Miscavige following in L. Ron Hubbard's foot, footsteps because L. Ron Hubbard somehow awarded himself a whole bunch of fake medals and uh, <laughs> and built this very very impressive uh, resume of all these things that he did when he it was one hundred percent fabricated and now somehow David Miscavige is, is just following right down his footsteps doing the same thing and David Miscavige has never been in the military and he's trying to get himself some fake medals. So I don't get it. It, it, You know, it's also says something about David Miscavige because I mean, I worked with the dude for 15 years at the imp base. I mean, first off, first off, you got to set up like a baseline. Sure. David Miscavige, David Miscavige said that battlefield earth with the one with John Travolta was the best movie that he had ever seen. Like it was the best movie ever produced in the history of movies. David Miscavige, but David Miscavige said that. Now, one of the reasons he might have said that is because <laughs> he himself micromanaged every single step of the production of that movie um, in terms of the costumes, the, who got picked as the director, the uh, you know the sets, the special effects, the editing. He was literally trying to steer that thing any way he could through. John Travolta or through other people that were, you know, the producers on the movie. But uh, when it came out, he did say that it was the best movie he had ever seen. So, so that's our baseline. So we know that. But in addition to that, when he was at the base, I mean, he was super, super hyper conscious of his, of the way it appeared that he was being viewed. So the way the public's perception of him, there was a guy named Jeff Baker who was the photographer who they were – I think they were at Tampa Airport. And Dave Miscavige was – this is when he used to fly commercial. He doesn't fly commercial anymore. He's he's on a private jet every chance he gets. But, but when, before when he flew commercial, he was at the airport and this guy Jeff Baker yelled across like a terminal and said – Mr. Miscavige, sir, or something. He yelled out at him. <laughs> and the fact that he yelled out at Miscavige to get his attention was like, what are you doing? Why would you Why would you yell out at me? You know how many Scientologists could have been at the Tampa airport that could see you yelling out at me like a dog you're calling me? What the hell? <laughs> so this guy, this guy, Baker, this Jeff Baker dude got no serious heap of shit for for just yelling out at him to try to get his attention. Um, But then there was another time when we were doing an event at the Shrine Auditorium and there was this makeup girl. Her name, her name was Sarni and Sarni was David Miscavige's makeup girl for years. She did his makeup every time we had an event. She did his makeup. She does makeup wherever UK, the free winds, the Shrine, anywhere there was an event, Ruth Eckert Hall in, in uh, Tampa or uh, Florida. Anyway, this one time, I don't know what happened. It was an off day for her. But she made, the way she did his eyebrows, the way she painted his eyebrows, and the way she did his makeup, she made him look like Spock. Like she made him look like a, Vul- <laughs> a Vulcan. And he went up on stage and he did like the intro to the event, like welcome to the March 14th event or whatever it was. And um, and everybody saw it the second he got up there. Like, oh my God, he looks like Spock, and um, and he could see himself in the monitors on the stage as well, and he could see that he looked like Smock, uh, Spock, <laughs> and he lost it. I swear, I think we had to get, we had to get after that, we had to get the guy that did Bill Clinton's makeup to come to Gold, really, and teach them. <laughs> And teach a new girl how to do David Miscavige's makeup because Sarni wasn't allowed to do his makeup anymore because she made she made him look like Spock one time at one event, but um, but he he had his own tanning bed. He used to take uh, HGH human growth hormone. He had um, he had a gym at the base. I mean, this gym Ron Miscavige would know for sure because Ron Miscavige was kind of like an exercise guy, like a weightlifting guy. Yeah. And but this but this equipment at the base, Dave Miscavige had this gym built 
And it was, I would, it had to have been at least a hundred thousand, maybe $200,000 gym. It had all of the latest stuff, all of the best equipment you could possibly get. Um, it was a built, the building, the whole building was built for all this stuff. And the, and the, the general staff were not allowed to use this equipment or use all this stuff. It was David Miscavige and anybody who he said, like there was some security guys and a few people that were allowed to use this gym. And, um, but otherwise he was working out and just, he had so much attention on his body and how he looked and, you know, his shirts, pants, shoes, suits, all these things, all handmade for him, custom. They had body molds done of his feet. So he could. <laughs> They would send these off to Italy to have shoes made for him. I mean, it would, it would, another thing is when we were at the base for, you know, we were getting, on a good week, we got like 45 bucks. We got 50 bucks and they took taxes out. Right. And I think for the first few years I was there, I think we actually even got $35 a week. It went up to 50, um, but we were getting 35 before that. And when it was David Miscavige's birthday, I'm pretty sure his birthday is in April. Yeah, it's April. And yeah. Dear, dear, when it was his birthday, a few weeks leading up to his birthday, we would all, our pay, like maybe 10 or 15 bucks would be deducted out of our pay to go towards a gift for him. And now in gold, there was like three, 400 people in gold. So you're talking about 10 or 15 bucks, maybe two, three, four weeks and all that would be pooled, and we'd buy him a, a camera lens or an underwater camera body. Or, I mean, I can remember we he got he got suits, he got uh, camera equipment, he got a bike one time that you, you could pick it up with your pinky. It was like a racing bike, like uh, uh, not a not a motor not a motorcycle, but a, like a pedal yeah. bike yeah. that was an for an for light. Um, he got motorcycles too. We, we got him, I think at least two or three times he got motorcycles. Um, we got, um, now this was just gold. Yeah. There were at, in, at the end base, there's, there's another bunch of organizations. So there's exec strata, there's RTC, there's CMO int, there's CMO gold. There's, uh, there's, uh, CST, which is up in the mountains and running springs. There's no. IES. There's, no, no, wait a minute. Let, let, me, let, let me get this straight. So David Miscavige is not getting one birthday present. He's getting dozens of birthday presents from different Sea Org orgs. Oh, tw not dozens. I mean, yeah, dozens, multiple dozens, like maybe 30, 30 or more, because he's getting all of these stamps of all of these different organizations. And this is not just for his birthday. This is for Christmas as well. So you're talking about... Maybe oh, Golden Arrow would give him a fifteen twenty thousand dollar present for for his birthday, and then th you'd have to do the same thing all over for Christmas. And here's here's the rub, though: you keep getting him these gifts, and everyone else is getting him gifts. It's a whole job just to coordinate all these different people getting him what he wants and not getting the same thing. So he's getting a gift from I'll tell you CMO and CMO CW. CMO East US, CMO IXU, CMO ANZO, CMO PAC, uh, ISA, CST, Gold, RTC, FSSO, which is like the free wins, the FSO, Flag Crew, Able, Wise, SMI, FLO, and then that's all those guys. That's like that's like usual suspects. No matter what, those guys are all getting a birthday and Christmas. But then let's say he went to Spain and he went to New York org and they and they got ideal orgs this year. Well, those orgs were getting him gifts because he just m did this big thing and made their org an ideal org. So now they're now getting him gifts. And so you have you just have the most expensive gifts you could possibly like if you were to make a wish list of I mean ASI got him a <laughs> BMW 635 for his birthday. I mean He's, we're not talking, I'm not talking about a tie. I'm not talking about a, yeah. a paperweight. I'm talking about like things that have to be garaged. That's a birthday. Like he could get so many gifts 
for a birthday that you they need to build a storage facility at the property. <laughs> so that's how be, much stuff is coming. Okay, to get that to get that many gifts, and you mentioned there's like a, a twenty five thousand dollar underwater lens that was like two feet long. So, right. Oh yeah, no, he had these zoom lenses. He had underwater lenses. I mean, underwater camera bodies, video cameras. You could. And th this was in the this was in the nineties and the the two thousands. So some of this stuff, you know, you could make a lot more compact and less expensive. But I mean, Back they were then, building yeah. custom vehicles. We one year we got him a golf cart, a limousine, a golf cart limousine. <laughs> so it was an actual. It was like a proper golf cart, but it would see it seated like ten people, and it was a stretch. <laughs> it was a stretch golf cart, and 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 he didn't mind getting all this other stuff, but he did not like this golf cart. And he said, "Well, I can't get a gift that I'm going to use for work." Oh, and yeah. I think there was some kind of tax. I think it was like a, what do they call it? A nurement? Yeah, nurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we're basically he's benefiting from the organization personally. And so he took the motorcycles and the cars and all that, but cause that's for his personal use. But if he was gonna drive around on the property during his work day in this golf cart, that was gonna blur the lines. And it was also, it was kind of, it just, it was like one of those things like you really think I'm gonna drive around in this golf cart? Yeah, he, they drove, he drove around yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. He drove around in it for fun when they gave it to him. But then he ended up giving it back. And so we spent all this money on this golf cart. I mean, it was tricked out. It had rain gear that went on it in case it rained. And it was like, ugh, it, was an, it was a hot mess, this golf cart. But it ended up being the Golden Era Productions port captain, the, like the PR person at Golden Era. It ended up being their golf cart. And they shuttled around visitors to the base on it or something like that. But, um, but I mean, the amount of gifts cars motorcycles the the suits that was the other thing is it was like they're telling us us this at our our lunch muster like listen we're all gonna throw in this money um this is the last week everybody's got to give go when you pick up your pay you got to throw in to to be able to get this gift this year what we're getting cob is this really really nice suit that he wants that's made uh, this guy his name was richard Lim. And he had a, 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 a tailor in Beverly Hills. It was a tailor in Beverly Hills called High Society. And it's where George Clooney and Will Smith and Brad Pitt and, you know, any funny Hollywood fuddy daddy who's getting a custom suit yeah. made would get it at this place. And this guy was the only guy who made suits for Dave Miscavige. I mean, his, his regular shirts were made by this guy. Everything that David Miscavige wore pretty much. I'd say 90% of it came from this one guy, uh, Richard Lim um, in uh, Beverly Hills. And so it was like, we're all going to throw in and we're going to get Dave another suit made by Mr. Lim. And I mean, the fact that I know a tailor's name who works in Beverly Hills and I've never been to him, that's how many times we bought stuff from him. <laughs> yeah. Like, why, why, would I, why should I know Richard Lim? Like, that doesn't make any sense, okay? I've never had a tailor make me anything. But I know Dave's tailor because we literally, it, it, I would if we made him ten suits, I think I might be off by half. I think yeah. I think it was twice that. But because it was every birthday and every Christmas, it had to be something, and it had to be something that not everybody else was giving him. And um, and we were kind of like the gold were the cheapskates because we had so many people, we could just throw in like five or ten bucks or ten or fifteen bucks. RTC would throw in $100 for his present, or ASI would throw in $500,000 for his present. So th with these organizations where they're making more money because they're being paid minimum wage because they're, they're not a church or they're not a, a clergy-based organization. They're a, they're, uh, they're, they had to pay minimum wage to these people. Um, just the way the, the, the tax structure, sure. the way the organization was registered so they were making a few hundred bucks a week. So for them, it's like, hey, you're going to give a thousand bucks for a gift. It was like, okay, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But um, that's how they're buying him a BMW, where gold bought him a, a lens for a camera. <laughs> we weren't, we weren't buying no BMWs at gold. That's for sure. 
No, not at all. But you know, how I look at this is like, if I had to sit down and make a birthday list of like, say I get 24 gifts for birthday and 24 for Christmas, I would have to sit down and spend some time thinking about what high end, what twenty four high end luxury gifts. I'm not just using that number, but you have to put some. Well, yeah, but, but even that, that's a lot of stuff that you have and to I know. come up with. Like, this is what I want, and and also being pissed when you don't get it. Like, what the hell? I thought uh, I thought you guys were going to get me that BMW. What's up with that? Where is it? You know, oh, like yeah. that's it's just and just having that. And th this is another thing. This guy's in the Sea Org, right? He doesn't. He is a Sea Org member, the most dedicated. No, man. This guy, this guy lives like a king, and and he is eating like a king. He's you know he's getting all this medical stuff and HGH and the his calories. That was another thing. They used to weigh this dude's food. Every single thing he put in his mouth had to be logged the exact calorie intake that it was going to be. Because he had to have it, you know, just perfect. There, nothing could be off it, with all his his weightlifting and his exercise and all these things. Were just he had so much attention on his appearance. Oh, another crazy thing, dude had the worst eczema. You would he would throw he would have a meeting and he would throw shit at us in the meeting. Like he throw like you you do these submissions, this uh, proposals and these. Uh, legal size manila envelopes and they'd have you know a bunch of papers and attachments maybe some videos or cassettes in them or something and he'd just take this whole thing he'd throw it at you in the meeting um that was his way of rejecting it saying that he he had he wasn't going to approve it uh he'd throw it at your face but uh he'd throw it at you and then his hands would bleed really his his skin, his skin was so dry and fragile and cracking that just from throwing something at you, he would cut himself and bleed. And um, and this happened all the time. His, his communicator, his assistants, they had Band-Aids on them. So when he did it, he would just put his hand up and they'd, they'd wrap a Band-Aid right around his cut. And it was like, back to throwing shit, you know, right back to it. But um, And you know what? Eczema, it can be, associ can be associated with, um, <clears throat> with asthma. But I've noticed in, in the recent pictures of David Miscavige, his hands look extraordinarily, they're very leathery. They're beginning to really show yeah. his age. He's born. Well, I think, that's, I think that's also sitting in that tanning bed all the time. He, mm. when he had a tanning, he, I know uh, John Brousseau, who did a lot of work on setting up his stuff and taking care of his cars and motorcycles and his building. <clears throat> Um, he said that he had a tanning bed to put all others to shame and, uh, and it was like a special room and, you know, so I don't, I don't, I don't uh, doubt that he yeah. cooks himself in there, puts himself on preheat 450 and jumps in that thing for a few hours here and there. Yeah. Tanning is one of the worst things you can do to your skin. And even if you use pre tanners and everything else, it's still one of the worst things you can do for your skin. And uh, when I was in, you know, lighting for years, I, uh, sun tanning was part of my portfolio, sun tanning lamps to yeah. man manufacturers of sun tanning beds. And I wouldn't, I would not go near a sun tanning bed ever. But that is certainly explains Yeah, you're basically like cooking, you're basically cooking your skin. I you're, mean, you're, you're irradiating. You get right down to it. UVA and UVB, it's not any. So his fake metal, his appearances. You know, his meticulous attention to his birthday gifts, which, like I said, would take a long time to sit on and make a list. When he opened Scientology TV, that was his first appearance, if you will, public appearance since uh, the Ted Koppel interview back, I believe, in 93. And did Yeah, you that makes sense. That's probably right. So this is only the second time he's made himself available public. What did you think of his short speech when he opened the network? It's just like any other thing that he would do at an event. Like it, it's pretty much kind of the same spiel he does when he does event speeches and when he opens these orgs. And when you, it's funny because I'm so used to hearing these speeches over the years that I don't really, I just, I just zone out as soon as he starts mm. talking. Like, oh god. But um, when you see what people's reactions are, they're like, why is he talking so weird? Like. Why does he talk like that? Like, what he, it's kind of sing-songy or 
why is he talking so slow and why are there so many pauses and why are there, you know, like what's wrong with him? He doesn't talk like a normal person. And then when you watch it and then you compare it to somebody else who's just talking, you go, oh yeah, you're right. I guess he does talk kind of weird. You know, the way, the way he talks is, is it's, it's a thing itself, the way he does it. He doesn't just talk like a regular, he doesn't have a conversation. He doesn't say something. It's this very calculated, like every single word has to be said a certain way. And then there has to be a pause, a certain amount of pause for you to think about what he just said. And, you know, he's not, you're not just being there having a conversation. It's this weird thing where, it is. you know, that's, the, that, that's why it's become the words themselves have been so wordsmithed that he can't just talk. He's, he's reading a prompter or he's reading a speech that's been prepared and um, and that's the same thing he does at the at these events. It's the this guy. There's a guy that writes for him. His name is oh. Danny Sherman. Yeah. And um, and Rinder, Mike Rinder has a really good. He calls it Sherman speak. He's like more Sherman speak, exactly. more Sherman speak. And that's exactly what David Miscavige does. He he speaks Sherman speak, which is this weird way of talking and these circular sentences that. You could say this big, long, wordy sentence, but at the end of the day, you ain't said shit. Like, it doesn't mean anything. No. It's just all this fluff that's just jammed into the sentence. At the end of the day, you could have just said, we just opened a TV channel. You know, you didn't need to, you didn't have to tell them, you didn't have to say 27 sentences to say that we just opened a TV channel. We're going to show you a bunch of videos. You know, it's like, we're doing this, we're doing that, and... We, we're trying to – it's basically a way of making what you're saying seem more important because you're not really saying anything or there's not really any meat there on the bone. So you're trying to you know, broth it up and you're trying to make it something more than it is um, sure. just because there's nothing there. So I, And, that's, and that, that's what I was telling somebody that – I was talking to Aaron and, uh, and Chris Shelton. And I was saying in Scientology, it's all about movie magic. You're trying to make something seem like it's a certain way when there's really nothing there. It's all imaginary. There's no real tangible thing that, that's being done. There's no real tangible actions that are being taken. There's no real products being produced by this TV station. We want to talk about how many languages we can produce things in. And we want to talk about all these things. We want to talk about how we can print things on paper and how we can print things on paper in many different languages. No one gives a shit. There's no reason that we should be talking about this, but they're trying to make it like, no, no, we're doing something. We really are. We really have something that we can talk about. And um, and they do all these like dolly shots down printing presses. And it's like, okay, that dude's stacking some paper on a conveyor belt. And this guy's taping a box. And you know, you're just like, and I remember when we were there and we'd shoot these things and we would, we'd have to milk and milk and milk it and do dolly shots and fancy camera angles and all these sort of things to basically say, we just came out with a course in 16 languages. I mean, that's a four minute video, but at the end of the day, we just came out with a course. We made some CDs and we, we made the CDs and we printed some books to put in with the CDs and we did that in... 16 different languages. Okay. Like people do that all the time in other sure. places, except for, except for they just put it online and you just download it. You don't need to go out and buy a CD anymore, but okay. But yeah, you guys did that. Okay. Yeah. Like, Scientology tries okay. to exaggerate everything. Uh, I want to make one, uh, a final point, get your reaction to it. The only notable thing in Miscavige's opening of Scientology TV and, and the, the message they're trying to push, it's damage control. Instead of saying, we hear the criticisms and we'd like to respond to them, the church tries to deflect by saying, we know you're curious about Scientology. And that was the evasion. That's where it failed critically. Yeah. Curious? Well, yeah, we, no we thought so. People are curious why you guys aren't aren't gone by now. Or we're curious why you don't answer why you keep 
abusing people or we're certainly not curious about Scientology. Most people know way more than they want to know about Scientology. <laughs> they want to they want to know why you we're curious on why you haven't been sent to jail yet. That's what we're curious yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> or we're curious about why the IRS hasn't revoked your tax exemption. So this kind of deflection, yeah. this kind of deflection was an attempt to redefine all of the outrage, the public outrage. Yeah. Into saying, oh, it's, that's just curiosity. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's expensive. Outrage. It's expensive deflection, too. I mean, they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. The ads alone, they were they had ads everywhere. I mean, I was seeing ads. I was watching uh, Discovery Channel. I was watching some, uh, like, Deadliest Catch or some show, and they had ads on there. I thought, wow, they're really going crazy on these ads. Yeah, like, they, did, they did a saturation. Wow. Mark, you've been around television production. Uh, the one brag Scientology made is that our network, Scientology TV, opened with 25 hours of original content. And I thought, wait a minute, for $100 million, you only have 25 hours? Yeah. That's, that's yeah, like no, that, four, that's four, another $4 million an hour? I mean, after four years of work and $100 million, all you got is 25 hours? Yeah, that's it's silliness. And the other thing that's silliness about that is almost all that stuff was regurgitated or just repurposed. And they obviously they didn't produce it at that facility. They're, they've been producing this stuff all along, regardless of the facility or not. So and even if they did produce it at the facility, it's like, yeah, exactly. You just spent $100 million dollars. You made 25 hours of TV for a hundred million dollars? Are you kidding me? Like, what are you gonna do next day of programming? Like, yeah. you're gonna, you guys are, you guys are gonna, and that's, to me, I kind of thought, these guys are gonna be gone quick. Yeah, mm -hmm. they might have built, they might have $3 billion in, in assets and cash and everything else, but if they're spending a hundred million bucks for a day of programming, they're going to run out of money really quick. Oh, it uh, and I don't even know. Yeah. And how much it's costing them to even have the channel? I don't know if anyone's found out what that cost is. But you know, Discovery's got a channel, and they run ads every hour throughout every show. They're paying for shows. They're paying for programming, but they're also paying for that channel. Scientology. Their only thing they're doing is paying. No one's watching. They're paying to run the, the channel. They're paying to run ads. And they're not getting any people into Scientology. I'd be interested to find out if they spent $100 million, they aired all that programming, did they even get one person to come into Scientology? I don't know, man. Well, they're not and even if that person, they're not, they're not Even if that person came in. Yeah, even if that person came in and did a course. I don't know, man. Yeah, even if that person came in and did a course, a two hundred dollar course, you go like, I don't know, man. When when they do these doc, these uh, like uh, what do they call them, infomercials or uh, the these sales type uh, shows yeah, on yeah, TV, yeah, infomercials. They, yeah. they, it's a science. It's a science. I mean, they know they're going to spend X amount of dollars on the show. They're going to air it at this exact time. That's when the people that we want to buy our products watch TV. This is the kind of show they watch. And if we don't make a hundred thousand dollars each time we air this thing, it ain't worth airing. And, no. and it's just it's just a number it's just a numbers game. I, I, I literally I think that's the only luxury that Scientology has is they don't give a shit what the numbers are. They're just gonna throw the money down the toilet. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, no one can tell David Miscavige it didn't work. No, so not at all. <laughs> keep spending money. They're just gonna keep spending money and no one's going to come back to him and say, hey, dude, uh, no one's coming into the orgs and you spent, you know, 500 million bucks. Like, uh, we need to do something different. So, yeah, yeah the cash burn rate has got to be big. And to, to spend 100 million to get that little uh, in return, it, it, it shows a lack of leadership strategy. It also shows a lack of transparency, even though David Miscavige has just claimed to have gotten a medal for transparency from the Columbia National Police, Scientology is absolutely not transparent. And I've read no. the propaganda on Twitter. They don't have the numbers. And I'll give you one more ridiculous data point uh, on Twitter. 
uh, Stanley, Scientologists Taking Action Against Discrimination, right? They're little, yeah, the, they're, the, they're, fake, the, they're, fake, the stock photo, the stake, the stock photo, uh, Twitter harassers. Yes. Yeah, the little, the little Gestapo uh, OSA people. Ed Parkin, who is a a nobody, if if you weren't around OSA and you didn't know about it, Ed Parkin is an obscure member of Scientology's Office of Special Affairs in his sixties. Yes. Yeah. Right. He's he's just obscure. Nobody knows him, unless you're a critic or a former member. You've never heard of him. He claims on Twitter to have 41,700 followers. And I know Osa is listening to this. Osa, how is it that Ed Parkin, who's a nobody, you know, outside of your little bubble, how does he have yeah. more followers on Twitter than your $100 million Scientology TV network that you probably dumped tens of millions of dollars of ad buy into? How does that work? Yeah. Mark. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make it none of their numbers actually now that you say it, I mean I don't I don't know how many followers I have on Twitter. I don't follow it that much. Yeah. Maybe I might have ten thousand. So basically I've spent if I spent twenty five million dollars, that would make sense that I have twelve or ten thousand followers. Well you have ten thousand two hundred followers. Okay, ten thousand two hundred. There you go. I wasn't far off, um, but I didn't. Spend, I didn't spend. <laughs> I didn't spend twenty five dollars on Twitter. Put those twenty five million dollars. So they spent a hundred million dollars, and they can't even get. I mean, even thirty thousand. It seems kind of like. It seems so disproportionate to me. Like, I don't know. I didn't like. I I bet you if I went on a real rampage and really went hit it hard hit the streets and rounded up twitter followers i think i could get thirty thousand sure. without spending without spending a hundred bucks <laughs> i don't know i don't i don't i just it, it just seems crazy to me i can't believe it is i you know i can't believe they only have twenty seven thousand. well actually i'm, I'm looking, gonna look now. <laughs> i'm looking at it right now i'm looking at it right now at scientology tv on twitter has twenty six thousand eight hundred followers 608, oh 608 likes and uh, 608 likes. Oh, God. I mean, 608 likes. And so th this I is might have more than that. You know what? I might have more likes you, than that. You have more likes, but look it up. But see, this is the point. <laughs> Scientology mm -hmm. is about social media fraud. And over against their social media fraud on Twitter, where they've used stock photo Scientologists that we've t talked about, uh, you know, stock photos of, of models that they purchase and they give them names like Rebecca Blair and um, and so on. Uh, yeah. When, when, when what it, was that when, one? What was the girl with the blonde hair? The uh, oh, Alicia Silverson. Everyone. Yeah. Has her stock <laughs> photos. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, now, what was funny about Alicia Silverson is that it sounds like Alicia Silverstone, and it's a blonde. So, yes. if you're if you, you're almost tricked into thinking it might be Alicia Silverson, yes. might be the actress. And um, yes. so, the, but the fact that, that Ed Parkin has more followers, it, it's just ridiculous. It, he should. Yeah, and even so. that, and even that. I mean, when they did this roundup. I don't know. I don't know what all the final things were. I only saw like the first day or two, but I know like Kirstie Alley took some huge hits. I, I want to say Tom Cruise lost he, like he a did. half a million followers. Yeah, on, when they on, did uh, the, the twenty seventh, they did a big purge. It's the first of many purges to come. Yeah, and look, I lost four hundred followers. I didn't even know. I mean, I don't pay attention to my followers. And so these click farms will friend all kinds of legitimate accounts so they can dilute with their fake accounts. So yeah. I, I, I lost 400, which is no big deal. It was funny, Scientology actually attacked me for losing 400 followers. In, in other words, we're trying to insinuate that I'd purchased them, which I didn't because I don't even think yeah. you can buy 400 fake followers. I think you got to buy <laughs> you, more. I, but yeah, George, you have to buy them in like blocks of tens of thousands or whatever well, like Scientology. Joy Villa lost, Kirstie Alley lost followers, the initial purge, Tom Cruise lost 278,000, which... Uh, Stacey Francis. Oh, yeah, Stacey she, Francis she, lost a yeah, ton she, of people. She lost a lot of followers. So uh, She didn't one, have a lot. 
she lost a lot. <laughs> she did. And this is why I go back to, I think, Scientology number of, of 26,800 is pretty much close to what we're really dealing with in Scientology. Uh, John P. Capitalist, a commenter at Tony Ortega's blog, uh, my blog, he thinks the number is more like 21,000, but nevertheless, I think that's about what we're dealing with. Now, when you look at what our site is doing with you, Chris Shelton, Tony, the aftermath, of course, and you, Mike Rinder's blog, the numbers are so much larger. And oh, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure Tony Ortega's site, and I mean, which they, what do they call the fringes on the outside of the fringes oh, of yeah, the internet? Yeah, Tony, the Tony Ortega's uh, web, his little website has been outperforming Scientology, I think, since its inception. I, I want to say, like, as long as he's had the blog, he's been beating Scientology, like, on a consistent basis on how many people go to their websites compared to people that are going to his website, oh, yeah, which also yeah. kind of proves the point that there are more ex-Scientologists than there are Scientologists, because these people are leaving Scientology than going to find out about what's really happening in Scientology from Tony Ortega at the Underground Bunker, <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> which I think is just hilarious. Yeah, it has a, hu a huge audience and uh, uh, certainly tremendous work. I'll, 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 hey, I'll tell you something interesting. It has a, hu a huge audience and uh, uh, certainly tremendous work. You know what? Your book, uh, Mark Headley, Blown for Good, the audio book is out on Amazon, and we look forward to it. Appreciate the time you've taken with our audience today, Mark. Always love interviewing you. Awesome. Thanks for having me, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Okay. For Surviving, uh, for surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. As always, thank you for listening, and we'll be in very good touch.